Coming up, the vulnerability of United States presidents to people determined to take their lives. Shots ring out and catch the whole world by surprise. A nation holds its breath in anticipation. I looked down instead of a hand to be shaken, there was a gun in a hand pointed directly at me. Was it a lone assassin or an organized group? A political statement or an act of insanity? Colossal said later, I didn't have anything against President Trump. As far as I knew, he was a good man, but uh, this we had to do. From Julius Caesar in 44 BC to Yitzhak Rabin in 1995, successful assassinations prove how vulnerable the lives of political leaders are. At least six attempts were made on Queen Victoria's life. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher escaped a 1984 bombing. If someone is bent on taking a politician's life, the target often has just luck to depend on, as some of the US presidents are all too aware. Join us for failed assassinations. Abraham Lincoln in 1865. James Garfield in 1881. William McKinley in 1901. And John F. Kennedy in 1963. Four assassinated presidents in less than a hundred years. The effect on history, unknowable. The losses could have been much higher, but for the astonishing luck and poor planning surrounding numerous failed assassination attempts. Assassination is a complex act. It's a balancing act between these motivating factors, these inhibiting factors, and each one has to be considered on its merits. And every one of the attempts, I think, has to be taken in terms of the political context of the times. Perhaps the best documented examples of failed assassinations are the not one, but two attempts made on the life of President Gerald Ford in the fall of 1975, a tumultuous time in the country's history. The United States had finally extricated itself from the long and tragic war in Vietnam. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. And while Richard Nixon's resignation the year before may have brought closure to Watergate, the wounds would take far longer to heal. Well, certainly the Watergate controversy plus the tragedy of the war in Vietnam were, were things that stimulated public uh, unhappiness with the White House, with our government officials in Washington. So uh, in that atmosphere, it was almost uh, natural that extremists would uh, be agitated to do something uh, very stupid. September 5th, 1975. President Ford is in Sacramento, California's state capital. As I walked uh, to the capital, uh, I had people on both sides of the sidewalk wanting to shake hands. Among those on the sidewalk is 26-year-old Lynette Fromey, her better known but mispronounced name, Squeaky From. The History Channel interviewed Lynette Fromey at FMC Carswell Federal Prison. During those years, the young people had all kinds of concerns, everything from civil rights to um, everything that was being destroyed in our, what we felt was our inheritance. This is our land, this is our water, what are you doing to it? The daughter of an aeronautical engineer and a stay-at-home mother, Fromey grew up in the Los Angeles suburbs during the post-war economic boom in Southern California. As a child, Lynette participated in normal activities, taking ballet lessons and particularly excelling at baton twirling. But by her 1967 graduation from high school, Fromey began experimenting with drugs. Later that year, Fromey drops out of a local community college and is thrown out of the house. She's about to meet the man who will dominate her life, Charles Manson. My father said, get out. 
I left, I went to a place where I rarely go, and he came along. We had a kind of lengthy discussion, and he told me I could come with him. He never, ever tried to force me to do anything, and he was really supportive and cared about the things I care about. But Manson and his followers soon became famous for the 1969 Tate LaBianca murders. Squeaky Fromm was not implicated in those particular murders, but her association with Manson certainly would indicate that she was very, very unstable. Manson's murder conviction doesn't deter Fromm's dedication to the environment. I had been concerned about a report that I heard about the tallest trees in the world, the coast redwoods, and those trees were in danger of falling. I didn't want to lose any of that. I felt responsible. In 1975, Fromey meets with a government official in San Francisco pleading that the redwoods be saved. She is unsuccessful and returns home to Sacramento. Well, just when I got home from that trip is when I saw on the news that Ford was coming into town. My original thought was, I'll go and talk to him. And then I realized that you don't get attention for that. You get attention if, you're, if they are scared. Fromey saw her opportunity to bring attention to the plight of the Redwoods. I got up and dressed in this flamboyant thing, this long red robe, and had the gun attached to my leg. And I got in there and got in the crowd and was looking around. Pretty soon, he, here he comes. And as I walked along, I couldn't help but notice a lady in a very vivid red dress who kept following me. And as I watched him coming closer, I felt um, that it wasn't the right thing to shoot him. But then I was stuck in this position, and I felt that the right thing to do was to go ahead. I went to shake a hand, and I looked down. Instead of a hand to be shaken, there was a gun in a hand pointed directly at me. So I stuck it out right at his stomach. I must have been about this far away. My Secret Service agent, Larry Boondorf, saw the gun, and he grabbed it and uh, stopped her from pulling the trigger. And another guy was trying to get my other hand, and they were diving at me and just panicked. I said, take it easy. You know, it didn't go off. And I said, um, calm down. And I was very calm. One of the other Secret Service agents grabbed me and pulled me back, and uh, I went on and went to the Capitol uh, and walked in and shook hands with Jerry Brown, the governor. I didn't mention anything about the incident. Why should I? Of course, I could have shot him. And to me, his life didn't mean more than the Redwoods to me. Fromey, without having fired a shot, is taken to prison. Though her attempt is sparked by her concern for the environment, other motivations soon become apparent. Frome believed that if she assassinated Ford, there would be this grand political trial where Manson could come and present his case. I think she hoped Manson would get on the stand and the world, the world would be saved. I wanted to bring Sandra Good and Manson and several of the people that were involved in the Los Angeles murders to court because they understood me and they knew my mind, which was important to any kind of defense. But the judge said no. With her request for these witnesses denied, Fromey refuses to participate in her trial and even has to be carried into the courthouse. When I realized that I couldn't get my people into court to talk about what we wanted to talk about, I, I said, okay, well, I can't come, and I'm stuck here, and I, I was 
lamented that for quite a while because I, I knew that I gave up my whole life for this. Though sentenced to life in prison, Fromey remains unrepentant about her actions. I had decided that I would take a look at the situation. And that's all. That was my intention. And I took a look at it, and I did what I did. September 22, 1975. President Gerald Ford visits San Francisco, California, just 17 days after escaping assassination at the hands of Lynette Fromey. Shortly after 3.30 in the afternoon, the president leaves his hotel, heading toward his armored limousine. As I walked out of the uh, St. Francis Hotel, uh, a shot was taken from across the street. The shooter, Sarah Jane Moore. The hero this day, gay rights activist and former Marine, Oliver Sippel. He grabbed her hand, and the shot went above my head three or four feet. The Secret Service agents jammed me into the back of the limousine, and we took off to the airport. While the president speeds towards the airport, Sarah Jane Moore, his would-be assassin, is taken into custody. Moore referred to Ford as a nebbish. And in, in some of the commentary, uh, pundits wonder, why would anybody want to kill someone as amiable as Jerry Ford? Like Lynette Fromey, Moore had a middle-class upbringing. Born in 1930 in Charleston, West Virginia, she played flute in high school and dreamed of becoming an actress. Instead, she briefly attends nursing school and then enlists in the Women's Army Corps. In 1950, she wed a young Marine, the first of five failed marriages. By 1973, Moore is a single mother living in San Francisco, supporting herself as an accountant, hardly the popular image of an assassin. She may have been inspired in part by uh, the other attempts, and, but I think that grew primarily out of her own particular feelings about being taken seriously. Seeking to belong to something, Moore becomes involved with anti-government protesters, but quickly comes to the attention of the FBI. In April 1974, the FBI approaches Moore, enlisting her help as an informant. For over a year, Moore's allegiance swings between the FBI and the band of radicals, alternately informing on one group to the other. Moore can't decide whether she's a friend of California radicals or whether she's an FBI agent reporting on California radicals. By June 1975, her situation is becoming tenuous. A close associate is found murdered, and Moore fears she may be next. She decides to prove her radical credentials with a desperate act. Yet in an apparent attempt to get arrested, Moore herself warns the police that she poses a threat to Ford. The Secret Service interviews her and confiscates her weapon, but they decide she does not warrant surveillance. There are many, unfortunately, unstable people in our society, uh, so the proper authorities can't uh, tail every one of them. Uh, that would be an impossible responsibility. In December 1975, Moore pleads guilty. The sentence, life in prison. She insists she's not insane, but rather driven by political motives. Certainly both uh, Frome and Moore are in many ways peculiar, uh, but there is a kind of weird 60s politics that motivates both of them. The domestic and political convulsions of the 1960s and 70s produced Lynette Fromey and Sarah Jane Moore, two counterculture assassins aiming for President Gerald Ford. Presidents have to assume that there is a possibility of an assassination, but a president can't uh, isolate himself from his constituents, the public generally, it would be a sad mistake, and it's one of those gambles that uh, you have to take. 
The first known assassination attempt of a U.S. president is on January 30th, 1835. The target, President Andrew Jackson. Richard Lawrence approaches Jackson at the U.S. Capitol. Fired first one gun and the cat went off and nothing happened, then the second, and it turned out that the powder and the balls had rolled out of the barrel into his pocket. Richard Lawrence was born in England at the beginning of the 19th century and immigrated to Washington, D.C. with his family in 1812. He led a fairly ordinary life, but then he showed increasing signs of severe mental illness. He'd also been behaving increasingly aggressively towards his sisters. He hit them on occasion, lashed out, threatened them. By 1832, Lawrence was suffering from severe delusions. He said, well, he, he was really the heir to the throne of England, and that Jackson was keeping him from getting his rightful heritage, and was keeping him from uh, getting to be king. Judged insane, Lawrence spends the rest of his life in a mental institution, the first in a long line of lone would-be assassins. Most of them do operate in isolation, uh, and most of them don't have any really other causes and as if the blinders go on and they shut off other options. One of these isolated would-be assassins is John Schrank, who shoots Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. Schrank, a 36-year-old German immigrant, had come to America in 1898. He lived with his aunt and uncle in New York City, working at their saloon. In 1910, his aunt died, followed the next year by his uncle. John Schrank had inherited a saloon, which he'd sold. He'd bought an apartment house in, in Manhattan, and he lived off the income of that. So he followed TR around the campaign trail that year. Schrank had formed a fixation on Roosevelt, who was making an unprecedented run for a third term in office, not as a Republican this time, but as the candidate of his self-styled Bull Moose Party. Theodore Roosevelt's run in 1912 was particularly controversial because of the third term issue. The idea that if you're in more than two terms, uh, you've, uh, you, you will have so much control of the jobs and the patronage that it will give you so much power that you might want more than the third term. To Schrank, the idea of a third term president was simply unacceptable. Many of us would then say, well, okay, write a letter to the editor and get, get a constitutional amendment going. But he just zeroed in on this particular solution that assassination was the thing to do. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, on October 14, 1912, Schrank gets his opportunity. Roosevelt leaves the Gilpatrick Hotel on his way to a rally at the Milwaukee Auditorium. There was a crowd there There was cheering at that point at a distance of about four or five feet was John Schrank, who then fired at him. The bullet went in right under the right nipple. It could have been fatal. The bullet went through 50 pages of manuscript of his speech, folded, then went through his steel spectacle case before it got to him, and, and it, it did penetrate a lung, but just barely, but it bled a lot. And uh, the doctors wanted to rush Roosevelt to the hospital, and Roosevelt said, no. I gotta make speech. Despite the blood pouring out of his wound, the ever colorful Roosevelt delivers his speech. And he opened his coat, and the bloody shirt was seen. He says, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. It's absolutely a Teddy Roosevelt story. And uh, it certainly enhanced his reputation in the country at large as this larger than life figure, though it didn't win him the election. The Republicans were split, and Wilson won anyway. John Trank is brought to trial and pleads guilty. He was judged insane and put in a, an institution in Oshkosh, Wisconsin for the rest of his life. February 15, 1933, Miami, Florida. Deep in the throes of the Great Depression, President-elect Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the new hope for America, delivers a brief speech before 25,000 people at Bayfront Park. From the darkness of the crowd, a diminutive Italian immigrant named Giuseppe Zangara 
fires five shots at President-elect Roosevelt. But who was Zangara, and why did he strike out so violently? Giuseppe Zangara emigrated from Calabria, Italy to the United States in 1924 and settled in New Jersey. A bricklayer by trade, Zangara enjoyed moderate success until the Depression hit. Outwardly, he appeared quiet and unassuming, but below the surface, he was an angry and embittered man. He'd never been in trouble. He was not a criminal type. But he was a disturbed personality in the sense that he was a loner, he was hypochondriacal, he uh, felt sorry for himself, he was a whiner, a complainer, but he was not a criminal type. Zangara complained constantly of severe chronic stomach pain, pain that drove him to distraction, pain he blamed on society. He maintained that he had to go to work as a small child, that ruined his health, that caused these stomach pains. Therefore, he hated all the rich, all the capitalists. He blamed authority. He blamed the government for what had happened to him. In 1932, Giuseppe Zangara relocates to Miami, Florida. But Zangara's rage at the class system and capitalism continues to build. He had thought of killing President Hoover, but then Hoover turned out to be a loser. Zangara happened to be in Miami and heard that Roosevelt was around and made an attempt to kill Roosevelt then. The evening of February 15, 1933, Giuseppe Zangara makes his way to Bayfront Park. In his pocket is a newspaper clipping detailing FDR's schedule and a pistol he had purchased for $8. There were people, lots of people there when he got there, and so he sort of pushed his way to the front. Roosevelt delivers a 145-word speech in under a minute from the back seat of his car. Meanwhile, Zangara is trying to get himself in position, and he, again, he's five foot one. There's all these thousands of people around him. He's got this rather big gun. Determined to kill the president-elect, Zangara leaps up on a chair and fires a shot aimed at the back of Roosevelt's head. He misses. Thomas R. Moore, a Miami carpenter standing behind Zangara, tries to stop the would-be assassin. Thomas R. Moore reached with his hands and he grabbed Zangara by the forearm and pushed his hand up, his arm up into the air. But that didn't stop Zangara. Zangara pushed his hand down with the pistol and fired four more shots. He fired five shots and he hit five people, but he did not hit Franklin Roosevelt. After the shots, the president-elect's car begins to move through the panicked crowd. Franklin Roosevelt looks back and he sees that Tony Cermak, the mayor of Chicago has been shot. He's standing there with the city manager who's holding him up. He's got blood coming out on his shirt. Roosevelt says, stop, to Fitzhugh Lee, the driver. Roosevelt responded very bravely. Instead of speeding off, he had Cermak brought into the presidential car, cradled Cermak in his arms, and drove him to the hospital. The police subdue the five-foot-one, 105-pound man, handcuffing him to the luggage rack of one of the coops. Zangara is taken into custody where a jailhouse confession lays bare his hatred for capitalists and authority figures. Despite Zangara's confession, rumors circulate that Roosevelt was not his real target. Rather, some believe that Zangara was actually aiming for Anton Cermak, the mayor of Chicago. There has been speculation for a long, long time uh, that one or another faction of the Chicago mob had hired Zingara to kill Mayor Cermak. What seems pretty clear is Zingara is not the kind of hitman organized crime hires. Zangara is much more the peculiar loner, certainly not the most efficient assassin you could ever hope to find. While Cermak fights for his life, Zangara pleads guilty to four counts of attempted murder. 
the judge sentences him to 80 years in prison. But on March 16th, Anton Cermak dies in the hospital. Zangara once again goes on trial. This time, the charge is murder. Zangara went through his routine. He said the same things over again. Yeah, I'd shoot him if I had the chance again. No, I don't know Cermak. Uh, no, uh, I'm, I, I acted alone. I don't know anybody. It was all my idea, me idea. He talked himself into the death sentence. Whether the judge had that intention at first or not, but when Zangara stopped talking, the judge gave him the electric chair. It is clear that Zangara, by targeting the president-elect, believed he would become a hero of the downtrodden. But there is also a strong suspicion that his true motive in the attempt on the life of Franklin Roosevelt was to bring about his own death, an act psychologists call suicide by police. He didn't expect to survive the shooting in the park. He thought that he would be shot down by the police. He said this. His motivation is anger from the pain, from the frustration, from the lack of success. I th think he probably didn't mind, maybe even wanted to die. If his goal was to kill himself, then he succeeded. On March 20th, 1933, Zangara is put to death in Florida's electric chair only 33 days after the shooting. Giuseppe Zangara's was the swiftest trial and execution in 20th century America. The assassination attempts against U.S. presidents have usually been committed by deluded, obsessed, lone assailants. But sometimes they are planned by more than one person and for political purposes. The 1950 assassination plot against President Harry Truman by two Puerto Rican nationalists, Oscar Colazzo and Griselio Torresola, was just such an attempt. They had good family lives. Uh, they were respected in their community. They had friends. Uh, they had a lot going for them. Unlike some of these kind of lonely people like the Zangara, the Puerto Rican nationalists were part of a close-knit community. Their goal? the independence of Puerto Rico, a self-governing commonwealth of the United States. Puerto Rico was acquired by the United States in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War. Puerto Ricans themselves are divided. A few want independence, some are satisfied with commonwealth status, some want statehood. That issue still is not resolved. On October 28, 1950, Nationalists in Puerto Rico attacked various government sites there, but are ultimately defeated. Torresola and Colazzo, both living in New York City, meet to discuss how they can help their compatriots. Their first goal was to get back to Puerto Rico to join the fighting, but they decided that that response wasn't enough, that maybe if they committed an act of what we would now call political terrorism, it would make more of an impact on Americans. They completely misread public opinion. They actually thought they could help Puerto Rico become independent by shooting President Truman. Colasso said later, I didn't have anything against President Truman. As far as I knew, he was a good man, but uh, this we had to do. Colasso and Torresola agree on the actions they must take. The two men take the train from New York to Washington. They bought one-way tickets to Washington. Then the next day, they went out in the morning and looked over the Blair House. The Blair House was the temporary residence of President Truman and his family while repairs were being made to the White House. Of course, Truman was terribly vulnerable there. Whereas the White House is protected by iron fences and a great expanse of territory, Blair House was right on the sidewalk. On November 1st, 1950, Colazzo and Torresola spend an hour walking around, noting the numerous Secret Service positions. You had a guard on in a, in a pillbox, a guard in a little house, at each end of the house, guarding these two doors. Then you had another agent guarding the steps at the foot of the steps, and still another one with a machine gun at the top of the steps. Everyone else had pistols. 
The two men then return to their hotel. Torresola oils their weapons and shows Colazzo how to use the Walther P-38 he had purchased for $35. That afternoon, Colazzo and Torresola approached the Blair House. This is a beautiful day, by the way. It's up in its 80s, and everybody's walking around, and everybody's out front watching the girls go by. 2.15, the assault begins. Well, it all happened so rapidly. At the critical moment, one came from one direction, one came from the other. This man came over and he didn't say anything. He just pulled out his gun. The sidewalk outside of Blair House becomes a battleground. Colazzo shoots Officer Donald Birdzell. The Secret Service return fire. Torresola attacks the other guard booth, shooting Officer Joe Downs and mortally wounding Agent Leslie Kofelt. In a matter of moments, the assassins have bridged the perimeter and are within striking distance of the president. The president was upstairs taking a nap. He stuck his head out the window, and we told him to get, you know, get back, so he did. Kofel, dying, raised himself up, and at the split second he lost consciousness, he fired one last shot and killed Tarasola, shot him through the head. Moments later, Secret Service agent Vincent P. Morose stops Colazzo on the entrance steps with a single shot to the chest. Colazzo falls with his hat still on. It lasted about maybe 20 seconds or so until everything cleared. Then we went out and and uh, kicked the gun away from this guy, and, and uh, it was all over. Truman responded with characteristic Truman-esque bravado. He thought these were incompetent assassins, and he said he had been shot at by experts, meaning the Imperial German Army he had fought in World War I. The final toll, two dead, assassin Torresola and Secret Service agent Kofeld. Two other members of the security detail were wounded, though not seriously. Likewise, Colazzo, the second assassin, was shot twice, but survived. My actual reaction to him was that he was a damn poor shot. I don't think he had killing in his soul. He didn't, uh, he didn't have that fire about him. I don't think they ever thought they would get through to Truman. They just wanted to make a demonstration, show that it was important enough for them to sacrifice their lives for the cause. Colazzo's behavior at his trial demonstrated the strength of his convictions. His lawyers begged him to plead insanity, which had worked for so many others in the past. He absolutely refused. He said that would do, do an injustice to his noble cause. He got up in court and delivered a dramatic speech for Puerto Rican independence, listing all the terrible things that had been done by the United States. On March 7, 1951, the judge sentenced Colazzo to death. But just before the scheduled execution, President Truman commuted the sentence to life imprisonment. Uh, he spent the next uh, 30 years or so in prison, uh, was a model prisoner, and finally President Jimmy Carter pardoned him. Colazzo left the United States and returned to Puerto Rico where he lived quietly until his death in 1994. March 30th, 1981. Following an address to a union group, President Ronald Reagan leaves the Washington Hilton Hotel. President Reagan! Reagan came much closer to dying than was admitted at the time. Once somebody told me he was shot, and that bullet was where it was, I had a flashback myself of John Kennedy dying in Dallas, and I thought, my God, we're going to lose him. A president is shot with an assassin's bullet, his fate unknown. 
What happens behind closed doors at the upper reaches of the government? I immediately called Jim Baker, the White House Chief of Staff, and he said yes, and it's far worse than we can tell to the American people at this point. Vice President George Bush, on official business in Texas, immediately heads back to Washington. Cabinet officials hastily convene at the White House. Cap Weinberger came into the room and said he had just alerted our nuclear forces. And I said, my God, you can't do a thing like that uh, because that'll be picked up by the Russians immediately. And they will conclude that we've concluded they try to murder our president. I said, that could be a nuclear war. With no procedures to guide them, the government's leaders have more questions than answers. The question was, did we have a functioning government? Did we know who made the attempt to kill the president? And were we taking appropriate steps in that regard? A world on the brink. The man at the center, John Hinckley Jr. What has driven him to such an act? He attempts to assassinate a president of the United States as part of what he calls the greatest love offering in the history of the world. He's attempting to win Jodie Foster's heart by this dramatic, brutal act. Hinckley had a long history of emotional problems. After seeing the film Taxi Driver, he formed a fixation on its young star. In his muddled mind, her attention and affection could be his, if only he could find the right message. But Ronald Reagan was not his first prey. He had commented that he had stalked President Carter in Dayton, Ohio, and in Nashville. In Nashville, Hinckley is stopped at the airport for carrying pistols. The FBI is notified. The Secret Service is not. His guns are confiscated, but he is released. Hinckley then turns his sights on the man who succeeds Carter, Ronald Reagan. When we left that doorway and walked out to the car, everything was quite normal. And then at 2.27 p.m., I heard actually two shots and then four more. The shots came right over my right shoulder, and uh, even though it was a 22, I could smell the sulfur and uh, knew instantly what it was. The Secret Service reacts. Tim McCarthy is a real hero in this event because his body shielded the president. The president's chief of security, Jerry Parr, pushes Reagan into his bulletproof limousine. I saw a bullet hole in the window and three bodies on the sidewalk, so that made me aware that it really was a serious attempt on his life. Left behind, Secret Service agent Tim McCarthy, shot in the stomach. Tom Delahanty, a police officer who was part of the security detail. And James Brady, the gregarious presidential press secretary, felled with a devastating head injury. When we took off, I could see the president sitting up, so I assumed he was all right. He spit up this bright red blood, and he was 70 years old, I believe, then. Just made a quick decision to go to GW. It turned out to be the best decision I ever made in my life. GW, the George Washington University Hospital. It's not until the hospital's trauma team examines the president that the assassin's bullet is found. He had been hit in the armpit by the bullet which rested fairly close to his aorta. The doctors are able to save the president's life, averting further crises. The following day, while Reagan is recovering in the hospital, his aides bring him a bill to sign. I think that was a good idea and, and reassured not only uh, Americans, but uh, particularly our allies and the Soviets at that time, that the tough old cowboy was still there. On April 11th, Reagan leaves the hospital, but it would be weeks before he returns to his normal routine. On June 22, 1982, a jury finds John Hinckley not guilty by reason of insanity. He's placed in St. Elizabeth Psychiatric Hospital where he remains to this day. 
Though Hinckley failed to kill the president, failure can be hard to define when it comes to assassinations. He succeeded in getting attention. I don't think he succeeded in impressing Mrs. Foster in a very positive way. The people that were more successful, I think, were the Puerto Rican nationalists. They did get that on the agenda. All of the failed assassinations, far from being random acts of violence, were the product of strongly held beliefs, however twisted. Delusions of grandeur, monomaniacal fear of vested power, hatred of the establishment for perceived wrongs, or the ideals and agendas of radical warriors in a time of social upheaval. And in every example, the outcome ruining, if not ending, the life of the would-be assassin. In 1994, Frank Eugene Corder despondent over a failed marriage and the death of his father, crashed a stolen airplane onto the lawn of the White House. It stopped only when it hit the building. More suicide wish than assassination attempt, this action did not harm President Clinton, who ironically was staying across the street at Blair House, where President Harry Truman was when his life was threatened. Discover more about this and every History's Mysteries topic at HistoryChannel.com.